I'm Ken Roman. Uh, I'm sort of an Athenian in-law. Uh, that is, my wife Ellen was on this board for 12 years. Uh, I also have a part-time job introducing Peter Baker in several places uh, here in New York. But I'm an admirer. Uh, Peter spoke here in 2014. His wife, Susan Glasser, who's here tonight, uh, and will be speaking the next year. And tonight we're getting them both. We have two political media stars together to talk about their insights on political issues. Peter is reported on four presidencies. Uh, Bill Clinton, uh, George W. Bush from the Washington Post, uh, President Obama from the New York Times, and uh, he was acting as Times Bureau, he was the Times Bureau Chief in Jerusalem, and they called him back Covered the Trump White House, we figured there'd be a little news coming out of that, of that place. And he is now the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times. He's a panelist on PBS Washington Week. And he's that rare bird in journalism. He's truly nonpartisan. You can trust his body. He's a very impressive guy. Uh, Susan is a big deal at Politico. Uh, Susan Glasser, she, she which covers political news in Congress, the White House, campaigns and issues. She's the chief international affairs columnist for Politico. She's the founding editor of Politico magazine. Uh, she hosts a new weekly podcast, uh, The Global Politico. Before that, she was the uh, editor of Roll Call, which covers the U.S. Congress, a foreign correspondent for the Washington Post, editor-in-chief, Foreign Policy Magazine, which she turned into a digital force, and she was co-bureau chief of the Washington Post in Moscow. Uh, and most uh, locally here, she, she has family roots on Nantucket, which is how we lured Peter and Susan back up here. It makes it a little easier. Uh, Peter has, uh, Baker's got several books. Uh, Peter's first book was The Breach, about the impeachment of Bill Clinton. The next one was Days of Fire, uh, Bush and Cheney in the White House. And uh, with Susan, they wrote a book called Kremlin Rising, Putin's Russia and the End of Revolution. His new book <laughs> is uh, Obama, The Call of History. And like his news analysis, it's a very thoughtful, balanced perspective of a consequential presidency, about hopes realized and hopes dashed. I can't recommend it more highly. Uh, be careful, though. Uh, if you drop it on your foot, you might break a toe. <laughs> but it's a terrific book, and uh, it's worth your attention. So please welcome the media power couple, uh, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, to have a conversation. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear in the back? No. No. All okay. Right. Is, this, is this on? No. Oh, am I doing it wrong? Sorry about okay. that. Okay, how about now? Yay! Yeah. All right, great. Uh, well, thank you guys for coming so much. We're so happy to be here. I, uh, if, uh, if, if he's an Athenaeum in law, I'm a Nantucket in law. And the great thing about having married into the Glasser family, including my uh, father and mother in law right here, is I get to, to join into Nantucket, and I've been uh, uh, lucky to come with Susan now for, I guess, 18, 19 years. So for us to be back here together and do this as a, as a joint thing is a, is a, is a tremendous feat. What we're gonna try to do tonight, uh, rather than give a speech, which sounds kind of boring, is we're gonna have a conversation, starting with each other. Uh, I'm gonna ask her questions, and then she's gonna ask me questions. And then we're going to open up for you guys to ask questions. So we want to make it a real conversation uh, and have some fun with it. Obviously, uh, in Trump's Washington, nothing much is going on these days. So there's not much to talk about. 
so try to be creative with your questions, uh, and, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. I, I want to start by asking Susan because we, as, as, as you just mentioned, we have been. Uh, uh, we were here three years ago and two years ago, and two years ago, the last time one of us uh, did this particular forum, the very, very thought of a President Trump was sort of unthinkable, honestly, let's face it, right? Two years ago when we asked people who thought Trump was going to win, I don't think there were a lot of hands raised. So my question to Susan, who was the editor of Politico at the time, if you'll ask both, is why did we get it wrong? And I include my own newspaper, right? Do you remember the dial on election night? Suddenly it was 95% Hillary, and suddenly, woo, 95% Trump. How do we get this wrong, and what lessons do we learn from that that are important to understanding our country today? Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you, and I want to thank Ken for that wonderful introduction, and my husband for that very gentle question, uh, because I think <laughs> some of you were here two years ago when I promised you something, and I was wrong. So I want to say I'm sorry, <laughs> and mea culpa, because two years ago, uh, for those of you who weren't here, I promised this audience that Donald Trump would not be the president <laughs> of the United States. Now, I figured at the time it was a fairly safe prediction to make. Uh, and obviously, I feel today both chagrined, but also in quite good company <laughs> in, in having failed to anticipate that. But you know, I was thinking about this a couple years ago uh, after a couple years had gone by, and actually managed to dig up on my computer uh, that speech that I gave two years ago, uh, in which first I asked for hands raised here in the audience for how many people would be voting for Donald Trump. At the time, he was leading in the polls in New Hampshire, and perhaps you won't be surprised to know that not a single person raised their hand uh, in the audience. Just like tonight, it was, it was a full house. Uh, and there was not one person who said publicly that they were thinking, or even thinking, of supporting Donald Trump. So at the time, my conclusion, incorrectly, as it turned out, was, well, see, you know, it, it shows you that no matter what the early polls are showing, uh, there's just no way that once people contemplate the reality of this, they'll go in that direction. What it really shows is something we've all, I think, been made very well aware of over the last nine months, which is that we basically live in a bubble. Well, welcome to the Nantucket bubble. I'm sure there are Republicans here as well as Democrats. Uh, we can ask for a show of hands, but my guess is we haven't radically increased the number of Donald Trump supporters here uh, in this room tonight. Uh, what's, what's happened is that we've learned how much the partisan divide in America is uh, ever more resilient, basically. And um, you know, I think that's something that everybody needs to do a lot of soul searching about. But I thought I would entertain all of you with, with one of my other thoughts from two years ago. Uh, and again, my deepest apologies uh, for having misled you to the extent I did. Uh, let's just say that Washington is now home to many deeply insecure pundits <laughs> these days. Um, but, I, but I thought, Peter, I would ask you about this because I, I've been thinking a lot about this. What I wrote in 2015 was, well, Okay, I don't think Trump will be president, but that doesn't mean we should just dismiss the Trumping of 2016 as some made-for-TV clown show, although to be clear, it absolutely is. In fact, some days I wonder if we aren't all being played for a brilliant joke. Remember the movie The Truman Show, where the boy turns out to be living in the midst of an elaborate hoax with his own life as the reality show plot and an audience of millions in on the joke? What if that's what's going on here? And we're all the unknowing characters in Trump's show. And he's sitting in a control room somewhere laughing. <laughs> so my question for you is, is that what's going on here? Are we all uh, the walk-on characters in Donald Trump's reality show? <laughs> well, first of all, the only advice I would give you, by the way, is uh, if you ever find yourselves being interviewed, don't be interviewed by your wife. She knows all your, uh, she knows all your tricks. She knows all your uh, hidden uh, uh, vulnerabilities. I, I think it's a great question, actually, because I, one of the things that you, we've seen, I think, in Trump's presidency so far is basically uh, the incorporation of reality show entertainment into our politics, right? Every day, every week, we wake up and we think, what is today going to be? And we don't know. Is it going to be war with North Korea? Is it going to be playing footsie with white supremacists? Is it going to be you know, t uh, trashing our own attorney general or maybe our own Senate majority leader? We don't know. And 
it's got this rhythm of, you know, wait to see what the next episode's going to bring. We're going to give you something really interesting next season. There's cliffhanger after cliffhanger after cliffhanger. And as somebody who has covered Washington for a while, it's remarkably different. Uh, most presidencies have a certain rhythm. You understand how they're going to go. You understand when, you know, they're going to be moments of, of, of uh, success and moments of failure. This one is completely beyond any prediction. When they, when they did bring me back from Jerusalem, and the guy responsible for that sitting back there in that row back there, I'm not going to point him out, but Bill, you know who you are. Um, I think they brought me back in part with the idea, okay, here's a guy who's covered three presidencies. He can help us figure out what to make of this one. Well, all of that experience is absolutely useless in covering this White House. I used to sit in meetings with editors and say, well, this is a way a president might think of this issue, and this is a way a White House might react to that. None of that matters. Every thought you had as a reporter covering a president is out the window, because this is somebody who doesn't observe the boundaries that we got used to. He doesn't see the, uh, uh, the, the, the rhythms of past presidencies as a guide to what he should do. He's gotten away with outrageous behavior before. It's how he got elected, as, in his, his point of view. So if he's the guy pulling the strings in the Truman Show, from his point of view, it worked. He got to the White House. He pulled off the biggest political upset in history, in his view. He convinced all the pundits, thus included, that something that couldn't happen did happen. So why should he change? It's because he gets a lot of tutting from the establishment. His core supporters are happy. They want him to be out there fighting. Doesn't matter if he doesn't always win. They see him as having their back. And I think uh, that's one of the things we have to make sure we understand in the bubble that we do live in. Now, um, my question to Susan is, she wrote a very perceptive piece about something along these lines, about something she calls, and other people call the blob, okay? This is not when the blob ate Washington. This is actually, Washington was eaten by the blob many years ago. The blob is the foreign policy establishment in Washington, which tends to be pretty bipartisan. You're gonna hear from Richard Haas, I think, a little later this month. He would tell you that he's got a lot of Democratic friends as well as Republican friends who share uh, pretty similar points of view on foreign policy. But Trump is the antithesis of the blob. He is sort of at war with the blob. Tell us a little bit about how the blob is reacting to Donald Trump's foreign policy. Well, you know, look, I think what's interesting is that in many ways I've observed that it's Republicans even more than Democrats in Washington who are experiencing this almost as a, a sort of traumatic event, in part because Trump has challenged many of the core national security and foreign policy beliefs that have been associated with the Republican Party in recent years. You know, we can talk about Russia more later in this conversation, but in many ways, uh, being a Russia hawk was almost synonymous with being a sort of up and coming young Republican in the Senate, say a Marco Rubio type in recent years. And now you have Democrats being a lot of sort of Johnny-come-lately Russia hawks, and you have a lot of Republicans who are looking with sort of bewilderment at what, how quickly their own electorate has seemingly changed positions on a core belief of principle just because their party's nominee has a different view of things. And so I think there's really a sense that both parties are being challenged by Trump's view of the world. And no one's really sure uh, what America firstism means as a guiding foreign policy principle. But in the last six months, it's very clear that you have sort of the grown-ups in the room in both parties doing their best, whether they're in the room with Trump or outside the room, to stop him. And what does Donald Trump not like more than anything else? He likes the idea that there's somebody who can control him. He has perceived that he's won this election, as you said, by being the guy who challenged every norm, who challenged every convention. And there's nothing that infuriates Donald Trump more right now, I think, than this notion that the foreign policy grown-ups, these generals that he's installed at the Pentagon and the National Security Council, Rex Tillerson at the State Department, that somehow they're going to be the adults in the room who constrain him. And so, you know, to me, what I see is that whether they're on the inside or on the outside, you basically have a, a, an undeclared war between the national security policy of the United States and this sort of guerrilla band around the president himself challenging that establishment. So that could be really risky. Look at last week. Donald Trump not only threatened nuclear war with North Korea, 
he volunteered on a late afternoon photo op from his golf course that he was considering military options against Venezuela. Well, nobody seemed to know anything about that. Uh, obviously, we haven't seen warships moving in the direction of Venezuela since that pronouncement, but I think you have a sense that that's where we've departed from the reality show script. So you didn't really answer my question <laughs> about whether you perceive it to be a reality show presidency or, in fact, it's something different. But, but that's a little bit what I was getting at. Uh, there's a real divide I see these days among people in Washington who we talk to between those who perceive this to be fundamentally sort of a, a spectacle, perhaps a terrifying one, uh, certainly a disturbing one to many people, but fundamentally not necessarily all that consequential because it's a spectacle and it's designed to hook us in rather than to really change the course of the country. And then there are those who perceive it to be something more threatening. And I think the people who are more alarmist tend to take the point of view that it's really on the foreign policy stuff uh, where Trump could do something uh, that really takes this from uh, a spectacle and into something much more serious. But can I ask you though, if, I wonder if, if you take away the words, right? If you take away the theater right. of fire and fury against North Korea, has anything tangibly on foreign policy been so far out of the Obama-Bush mainstream? In other words, if you put Bush here, you put Obama here, is Trump so far out of that? I mean, he didn't move the embassy to Jerusalem after he was told it would cause great uh, tumult in the region. He didn't actually rip up the Iran deal. He says he might, he might still, but he hasn't so far. He hasn't ripped up NAFTA. He wants to renegotiate. He said terrible things about it. It's a terrible deal, but he hasn't abruptly ripped it up. Is it, should we separate the words from the actions? Well, look, I think six months ago, there was a plausible argument uh, that we could say that. I think we have learned in the last six months that he is a substantially different foreign policy president than Barack Obama. It's true, they both shared some skepticism about the nature of ongoing American military commitments. It's true that uh, Obama was concerned uh, and understood that it was probably a post-American world in a way that the US wasn't going to be leading every alliance and dictating the terms of everything. But I think that was a better case scenario than the Trump presidency than we've actually gotten. Number one, uh, the White House has been far less organized and far more volatile and unpredictable in terms of its dealings with our allies. Number two, uh, the adults in the room theory has been completely thrown out. Trump has shown that he may hire these generals, but he's not interested in taking their word for it. And I think the ongoing internal administration fight over Afghanistan is a good example of that. His refusal to uh, endorse the basic principles of the NATO alliance in May when he met face to face with those leaders, I think is another very good example. That's the, the bedrock of American security policy and is something that clearly the President of the United States isn't committed to. And then the area where he obviously, I think, diverges most significantly from President Obama is in his disdain for and, and really unwillingness to participate in multilateral organizations, treaties, uh, and the kind of complicated multi-partner diplomacy that really has been at the core of what the United States has been doing, not only withdrawing unilaterally from the uh, Paris Accords, and that makes the United States along with uh, Nicaragua the only country uh, in the world, Syria. sorry, Syri yeah. Syria. Uh, and, and Nicaragua. Right, to not be a participant in that, but, it, but it's clear that going forward, the U.S. isn't going to be exerting the leadership role in the world that it has been uh, really for the last two and a half decades since the end of the Cold War. So to me, I've always felt that the really dangerous scenario for Trump where you get uh, into questions that we don't yet fully have the answers to lies in this convergence with, it's, it's the end of the post-Cold War era, right? You know, we have 25 years since the fall uh, of communism in the Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union, and you have really all these crises in countries of the former Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, they're all happening at the same time for a reason. So you have the collapse of that or order at the same time that you have this internal 
political crisis here in the United States. So I, I don't pretend to know the outcome of that, but I think that's where you start to get into these much more serious scenarios. So that, that shapes really my next question. These days, everybody is throwing around historical analogies. And in Washington, you can't go uh, anywhere or have a conversation with somebody where they're not arguing over, well, is it the 1920s? Is it the 1930s? Is this a replay of the 1970s and Watergate all over again? Uh, so I want to ask you, what historical analogy do you think is, is more appropriate? I mean, some days, you know, you wake up and you think, well, Watergate might be the best case scenario uh, for the United States. Remember that we thought maybe it was a global crisis happening along with an American political crisis, but in the end, uh, it didn't prove to be a lasting global crisis, uh, and uh, the U.S. came out of the 70s, you know, more or less uh, intact, if uh, with a wounded superpower pride, uh, but basically Watergate turned out to be an American internal political crisis more than an international one. So. What do you think? Is it uh, the 20s all over again? <laughs> I, you know, this, it's funny. This is a parlor game in Washington, you know, where you, you, you ask this question. And she knows by asking this question that I'm not going to answer. This is true. This is why she's asking. <laughs> uh, because I actually don't buy that. I don't buy that this is the 20s or the 30s or the 70s. And yes, I've used plenty of Nixon analogies in my own coverage, I'll admit. Because in yeah, fact, do, do a search and you will find uh, plenty of Watergate yeah. comparison. <laughs> but let's face it, he's asking for it sometimes. He fires his FBI director at the same time his FBI director is investigating it. That sounds so much like uh, a Watergate thing. And then he, he meets with, who, he meets with the next day, he meets with Henry Kissinger the very next day. He's inviting the Watergate comparison sometimes. He talks about firing the special counsel, Robert Mueller. Um, you know, it's, it's um, but I don't think it is. I think everything is, you know, there are historical patterns and there are historical precedents we should be aware of, and I think we should, you know, make sure to uh, spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this, but I, I think we also lock ourselves in too too much if we try to say, "Aha, it's this, and it's that. It's the same thing as that." Because this is he is different than any other president before him. I mean, he's not Nixon. He's not Andrew Jackson. He's not, you know, uh, he thinks he's better than everybody except for Lincoln. He's not Lincoln. Um, I think he, he and, and who he is and what he represents is important to understand where we are as a country right now. People did not elect Nixon for the reasons they elected Donald Trump, right? Uh, Trump tapped into a sense of disempowerment and disenchantment and, and alienation from the system in a way much more and much much deeper than Nixon did, I believe. And the interesting question is, I was looking at these numbers just this morning. 9.2% of people who voted for Barack Obama voted for Donald Trump, okay? Think about that, right? The, 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 the same guy who said, Donald, who said Barack Obama wasn't born in the country, right? He didn't even have a birth certificate, he was from Kenya, whatever, uh, attracted this same co of, this, this cohort of people, millions of people who decided that they were upset at the system enough that they would vote for Barack Obama in 2008 and they would vote for Donald Trump in 2016. That's an interesting phenomenon about America. And I think that Donald Trump is different than every other thing. I don't think he's like Nixon. I don't think he's like Andrew Jackson. I don't think these times are like those. And uh, so I kind of reject the uh, premise of the question is I think you knew I would. Um, <laughs> and my question to you, I want to follow up a little bit on what you just said. I mean, OK, we, in Washington, we call them the MMT, all right? McMaster, Madison, Tillerson. And there's this sort of Washington idea that these are the guys who are going to be, as Susan said, the grown-ups in the room, blah, blah, blah. How do we know they're not? Just because he says bellicose things, you know, how do we know they're not actually, in fact, having a significant influence on him? How do we know they're not? You know, the Afghanistan question that Trump asked is, we've been there 16 years. Why should I just keep doing the same thing over and over again? Doesn't he have a point there? Well, I think you can both have a point and also uh, have exploded any kind of rational decision-making process, right? Like both things can be true. Uh, and I think, you know, people who've worked much more closely uh, with this White House than I have, uh, it's been fascinating to hear their accounts of, you know, where the breakdown has really occurred. And I think where it has occurred is in uh, the taking what amount to more or less a collection of impulses and trying to turn those into a, a coherent 
governing strategy or program, whether it's for foreign policy or for a legislative program that we can talk about that, that has also encountered difficulties. Donald Trump is not totally without ideology. I, some people think that, but I, I don't agree with that. You know, he, he has a collection of impulses. Many of them have to do with foreign policy. Many of them have to do with the sense that America has gotten a raw deal in the world uh, internationally. If you look back at his rhetoric from the 1980s, he was saying that. Now, of course, at the time, it was Japan, not China, that was the big bugaboo. But you know, he's had a very consistent point of view that you would call sort of a trade nationalism uh, point of view about American foreign policy. He's certainly a skeptic about military intervention in the Middle East and you know what the benefit of it is. Uh, you know, he's talked about, well, we should have just taken the oil in Iraq and, and gotten out of there. He's mentioned uh, similar things when it comes to Afghanistan. Are there natural resources we can essentially uh, pillage and uh, you know, get back in exchange for our decades of military commitment there? Uh, the, the issue that Trump has, it seems to me, is, is a governance issue and an, and an organization issue. And that's where I come back to every morning, you know, when we're looking at this Twitter feed, when we're trying to understand the news, like, what is your decoder ring? What do you, how do we understand this collection of, you know, events that are bombarding us every day? And so, you know, for me, what I come back to is not some, you know, foreign policy manifesto or, uh, you know, some guide to how Trump is going to make decisions. I think, you know, looking to the man's psychology and his biography uh, as, a, as a businessman and looking at what he's done at key moments of crisis it has been a more sure guide in many ways to uh, understanding what's happened over the last six months than anything he said publicly in any news conference about Afghanistan or, or Iraq or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, because he, he is very opportunistic and he'll zig and zag uh, depending on who he's spoken with. But his actions in a crisis, I think, uh, often are shocking without being surprising, right? That, that's how I felt most of these days for the last six months, is that you know, there's an endless number of shocking developments <laughs> in this reality show, uh, but if you pull back, uh, none of them are all that surprising, right? They all sort of flow from the main thing. And so I guess what I'm really interested for you is what are the decoder rings that you feel help you not get it wrong day in and day out in trying to assess and evaluate these things, uh, not getting too far out in front of the news for readers of the New York Times, but at the same time trying to give them a useful frame. So if history is not a useful frame, uh, you know, what are some frames that you think do help us to contextualize or understand Trump? Yeah, that's a great question. And we're going to open up to questions in just a couple of minutes. Uh, the first one is I do think you need to, I, to disassociate words and deeds. Those are, in the Trump presidency, we see our different things. He can say all kinds of very strong, powerful things, and they get people going, and they're important. Words are important. But um, he hasn't actually stolen many other countries' natural resources, and he hasn't actually uh, gone to war with anybody. And he actually, you know, I think there's a, there are, there are, there's a disparity between sort of his impulsive desire to say things that are outrageous and things will get people worked up and his either willingness or capacity to make them actually happen. For instance, just today we have a story on the front page that talks about these subsidies for insurance companies. He keeps saying, let's, let's uh, let Obamacare fail, right, by holding back these subsidies. And yet every month they continue to pay them. Now that may change, we don't know, but so far there has been a disparity between words and deeds. So that's one of the important decoder rings. Uh, another important decoder ring is, I think you're right, is, is it look back at what he said for 30 years, some of that is very informative. The third decoder ring is, look back at what he said for 30 years and pay no attention to it. <laughs> because in fact, he may have said something completely radically different two years ago compared to what he's going to say today. Two years ago, he thought Obama shouldn't go anywhere near launching a strike on Syria because they use chemical weapons on their own people. That's none of our business. Syria is not our problem, he says. And then, of course, when it happens on his watch, he launches a strike and mocks Obama for not having done what he right. told him not to do. So the problem with this is that there are some core things, as Susan said, I think, correctly, that his sense that America has gotten ripped off, that we've gotten shafted, that is core to him. 
Beyond that, don't take too literally almost anything else he says because he could change it tomorrow. He said specifically, don't have China at these steak dinners. They're the enemy. They're awful. I can't believe you have them at these steak dinners. They should just have a hamburger on a piece of plate. And then what does he do? He, he, he invites Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, to Mar-a-Lago and has him for three days of uh, golf and, and, and hanging out. And he tell, declares him a great guy. Very few things are fixed beyond change. Really. Yes, but see, I'm going to challenge you on that, though, okay. because I, I think most people understand and are kind of wise to the game at this point that, you know, there's a Trump tweet for everything, uh, and you can find him saying, you know, any number of things. He's, he's the master of the flip-flop and the contradiction, but that that actually is a consistent personality trait. And that's where I would say that, you know, Trump's personality and his uh, behavior over the course of his life is actually quite consistent, and it's not surprising. Uh, you know, a through line is that he is uh, ideologically flexible, uh, you know, to be charitable about it, and that, uh, you know, that shouldn't be uh, surprising, and that, you know, there are other consistencies in uh, what he's done as president that might be shocking when they play out, but on the other hand, uh, are actually well documented. For example, look at his meltdown of the last few days. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you would think, well, nobody could possibly double down on, uh, you know, not condemning in strong and forceful language neo-Nazis in an American city, you know, except for Donald Trump. Do you guys remember the campaign? I mean, you know, look at how he was attacking a judge in his own case. Look at how he was attacking a Gold Star family in the middle of the campaign. So can anybody in this room really say that they're surprised that Donald Trump would do something that on its face seems to make no sense whatsoever politically. So, so that's what I mean about Trump's biography. But I know one question from the audience that we're going to get, so I just might as well preempt it, uh, is the question that people have had really almost since the very beginning of the Trump presidency. And I, you get it all the time, uh, which is a very weird question in an American democracy where we have four-year terms. But the question, right, is how will this end? Uh, to quote the immortal uh, David Petraeus. So, what do you think? How will this end? <laughs> I told you, don't have your wife interview you. Um, well, I would say the one thing I have definitely learned in seven months of covering President Trump is do not make predictions, okay? And I'm not gonna make one here tonight. I do think, though, that for all of the you know, fanciful scenarios of the 25th Amendment or impeachment or whatever, it is still far likelier than anything else that President Trump completes his first term and runs for re-election. And then the voters will have a chance to decide whether they want to give him a second term or not. The chances are far greater for that than any other scenario. Now, does that mean that the chances of something like impeachment or 25th Amendment are minimal? No, they're obviously higher than they are for the average president. We have a special counsel out there who has subpoena power and a grand jury, and he's investigating. And any time that happens, that is a threat to any presidency. Um, but we do have a Republican House with a Republican president. The two times we've had impeachment that went anywhere serious in our modern times, we had Richard Nixon with a Democratic House. We had Bill Clinton with a Republican House. So as long as they're of the same party, the, 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 the standard, the, 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 the hurdle you have to get past to, to have any procedure other than finishing your full term is pretty darn high. So I'm not sitting there waiting to uh, to see that happen, but um, uh, if it does, obviously we'll, we'll be interested in covering it. <laughs> uh, why don't we go ahead and see if we can open it up for questions. I, I don't think we have a, a microphone, so if you stand up, we'll call on you, stand up, speak as loud as you can, and if it's okay, try to make these questions as much as we can rather than, rather than statements. Peter, repeat the question. We'll repeat the question. Great. Uh, let's start right here. Does he know actually you think what's in the Republican health care bill? Does he know how Congress works in relation yeah. to the president? Uh, I, I kind of get the sense that he speaks in generalities because he can't. I mean, president Obama was always, whether he was right or wrong, whether you agree with him or not, he always had documentation for why he was supporting this or that. And this is kind of exactly the opposite experience. So what is your sense? Yeah, the, it's a great question. The question is, 
President Trump often seems to speak in generalities. Does he really understand what's in his health care bill? Does he really understand the details of the issues that he's talking about? And isn't that the exact opposite of Barack Obama? I think you'll find basically everything is the exact opposite of Barack Obama, right? <laughs> On almost every level, good and bad. Whatever you didn't like about Obama would be the opposite as well. It's, it's, um, it is, it's not his strength. Detail is not his strength. So, um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, my, a couple of colleagues and I went in to interview him a few weeks back, and uh, it was a fascinating interview. The guy is, you know, uh, capable of ha ha having a very charming and interesting conversation, and he makes his points, and he's persuasive in his own way, and he's, he's uh, confident and comfortable, and he's the opposite of this sort of, like, hostile figure that you often see in public. But his command of the factual details of the things he's talking about is often suspect. I mean, I'll give you a couple examples. I mean, like, he would mention in this interview a letter that he said James Comey, the FBI director he fired, had written to him saying, you, you have every right to fire me. Well, that's actually not what happened. That's not what happened at all. Jim Comey, after he was fired, sent a letter to his workforce, the FBI workforce, and said, of course the president has the right to fire any FBI director. But he didn't send a letter to the president saying, hey, go ahead and fire me, which is the implication of what the president was saying. So he, he has a real, um, he, his command of the details and, and, the, and the factual specifics are often, you know, somewhat suspect. Well, it, it, the question is, is it lying? And I, you know, I, in some cases, there's clear dissembling, right? In some cases, he clearly must know something is not accurate because he keeps saying it again and again when he's been corrected again and again, right? That's what, you know, people often ask, the New York Times has on a couple of occasions used the word, the L word, in a headline. We don't do that lightly, all right? Our executive editor, Dean Baquet, has made the judgment on a couple of occasions that we thought it was worthy because it was so brazenly untrue and that he had every reason to know it was untrue. In general, though, I'm very cautious about using that word because it presumes um, intent, right? And it, pre it presumes knowledge. And in a lot of these cases, I can't, no, 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 I just, but you know. Well, but I think, look, he wouldn't be the first politician who convinces himself of his own narrative, right? And politicians do that. Some cases, obviously, he, I'll give you an example. He keeps saying the words, failing New York Times. Have you heard that one? All right. That's factually not true, thank goodness. Actually, we, Trump has been great for business. Our revenues are way up. Our subscriptions are way up. We have 4,000 more paying subscribers since the beginning of the year. I hope we keep failing like this. <laughs> And he's been corrected numerous times, and he keeps using it. Okay, fine, whatever. But, but there are times it does appear to be intentional deceit, and when it is, it's our job to call him on it. Well, you know, it's an interesting point that you raise. Uh, the, the point was made up here that, you know, can you call it lying? Is it intentional? Does he doing it on purpose, uh, or does he believe his own hype? I, I, I had a conversation re recently with the Washington Post fact checker on this question, and he spent the last two years, and, and Donald Trump, by any measure, you know, is, is the most, whether you call them falsehoods, exaggerations, or misstatements, or lies, uh, he's, he's expanded, uh, you know, to an astonishing degree, uh, the line of work for fact checkers, in particular, in the media business. The growth industry. Right? So I, I had this conversation, I asked exactly that question. How much is it intentional? How much does he know uh, uh, about these things to consciously misstate? And he said, you know, if you go back and you look, I've tried to look at the patterns of the kinds of misstatements, and I believe many, though not all of them, are consciously done because they are playing to the preconceptions and biases of his political audience. And so he won't come up with an, a whopper just on something that uh, doesn't play to the base or doesn't have some political purpose in mind. And that suggests that there is a, a calculated logic behind many, although not all, of the misstatements. But, but I do think the original question, which was, you know, to what extent, basically, is Donald Trump sort of just blundering about in the political process uh, versus actually being well-versed in the things that are going on. When I talked with European leaders several times this spring as they went through their first round of meetings with Trump and they're really trying to get their arms around him, one of the things that it took them, I think, a little bit longer to realize in Europe as they uh, got to know him 
uh, versus those people who had paid close attention to the whole American political campaign, the Europeans, it took them a while to realize uh, just how ungrounded in history, how uneducated in many ways about the basics of American and international politics Donald Trump was. The concept of a truly novice uh, businessman becoming the leader of a major European country is, is very um, antithetical to the way those political systems operate. And so they actually misperceived, uh, many of them misperceived Trump to be sort of a, a dangerous ideologue with whom they disagreed. And I think it took them the first few months of the Trump presidency to actually realize the extent to which he was a complete newcomer and a very unprepared newcomer for the basics of the job, really. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's learning on the job in a way that uh, does explain some, but not all, of the, the crises that we're experiencing. This, this is the first president, this is a fact we should always remember, this is the first president who never spent a single day in political or military office, ever. First time. So it's natural there would be a learning curve. The question is whether there will be learning and whether there will be, you know, development and evolution into a, into a different, you know, into a different period. Yeah, this young, young man back there. Yes. First of all, thank you for coming, Zach. Yeah. Uh, and, I'll make sure you tell the question. Uh, you know, so I, I think everybody heard it, but basically, uh, it's a 12-year-old who is saying, "What else can I do? What can I do about this? I've gone to protests, I've written letters, uh, and what can I do in this?" Well, I would say the first thing that it occurs to me in a way that I think is probably going to end up being a positive, uh, although it might not feel like it at the time, is. If you were under any doubt, if anybody in this room didn't think that elections don't have consequences, well, this is a great demonstration that elections have consequences. And what I've been struck by in a, in a positive sense over the last six months, I feel like we've all had more conversations uh, about what core values are, uh, what our institutions of government are, uh, why they came to be, and why they matter. Uh, in a way that you tend to take those things for granted. And I don't think, you know, your generation, um, my son is also 12 years old, and my guess is that this is going to be a, a really formative political experience in the way that, uh, you know, I, I was too young to remember Watergate, but, I, you know, there's no question that Watergate shaped a whole generation of Americans coming into politics with a sense uh, uh, of the values of government and how they wanted Washington to work in a way they might not have before that. But I don't know. Do you have something more practical to tell Zach? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't have a, I don't know that I have a practical script for you. I would say it's awesome that you were involved. And I would tell you that, by the way, whether you were pro or anti, I don't, it does not for me as a journalist to care. What matters is that you're involved in your life and your community and your country. And too many kids your age haven't yet found that inspiration that you have. So this is an awesome thing that you're out there. Write your letters, go to your protests, you know, volunteer for a campaign. When I was a kid, I think I was 13, I, I handed out uh, bumper stickers or whatever for a guy running for Congress. I think it's a great way to, to be part of your community and your, and your country because it matters. And when you get old enough, think about running for office yourself. We need you. has been in the Oval Office with Donald, and he says that there, he believes there's a kitchen cabinet, a small number of people who he hangs out with and trusts. And he, he listed off maybe six or seven names, the only two of which I recognize were Ivanka and Gerald Kushner. Mm. So I, I have no idea what, what he knows, but is there a kitchen cabinet, and who would you guess would be the people Trump would stick with casting all over society. Right. Yeah, the question is, is there a kitchen cabinet around Trump in addition to Ivanka and Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, 
and I would say yes, and what's, but what's fascinating about it is that th this is the most tribal kitchen cabinet you've ever seen, right? This is, this is a, a kitchen cabinet that is at war with each other in a very serious way, and almost everybody in that White House will tell you that. What, what's stunning to me is to listen to every single one of them say, God, I didn't know how ugly it would be. And these are people who work right, by, right side by side with the next person in that kitchen cabinet. Um, as a reporter, I'll tell you this, like if you call and say, hey, I need somebody to call me back about Medicare policy, or I need somebody to call me back about, you know, uh, North Korea policy, you might get a call back. If you call and say, hey, I heard your rival is really up and you're down, boom, <laughs> instant call back. Instant call back. If you call and say, hey, I hear you're on the way out, <laughs> you're gonna get a call back because they're spending so much time fighting each other through us, and uh, I admit, Good for business, I don't have a problem with this, but it is very, very tribal. Now every White House has its kitchen cabinet, people who really matter around the president, the ones he really listens to, and every White House has its divisions, some of them ideological, some of them personality, right? Who wants to be most powerful in dad's eyes? Um, but I've rarely seen it, I don't ever seen it, as vituperative and, and, uh, and, and uh, divisive as this one is. And I don't know whether he, I think he likes that. I do, the only conclusion you can come to is this is what he likes. He encourages it. It's part of, again, the reality show culture. You know, who's gonna be voted off the island this week? Will it be Steve Bannon? Will Jerry get the boot? You know, probably not. The truth is he doesn't actually like conflict, right? It sounds funny. Here's a guy who gets up every day and he, and he, and he angers, he, he goes after somebody on Twitter, and, and the, but he doesn't like conflict personally. So does he, if he's unhappy with his attorney general, does he call in Jeff Sessions and say, hey, Jeff Sessions, I'm unhappy with you? No. He doesn't do an interview with the New York Times or on Twitter, and he has no conversation with Jeff Sessions for a week, right? He's averse to personal conflict, even as he sort of spreads, uh, spreads it in a public sense. But his kitchen cabinet does matter. There are a handful of people. They're up and down. It's, it's very much a palace entry kind of, kind of court. And uh, the one person I would say you will never see uh, thrown over the bus, but who might jump, uh, is Ivanka, his daughter, who he loves very much. Uh, but it wouldn't 100% surprise me if she and Jared end up back in New York after a certain amount of time saying, you know, enough of this. Well, it's also, I mean, on the specific question of the kitchen cabinet, Trump is very open to lots of outside inputs, right? And that's one thing that does distinguish this from the much more buttoned down Obama presidency. President Obama, uh, you know, did not have an open, freewheeling White House, quite the opposite of it, right? It was a very process intensive, very structured, even very hierarchical place where the staff uh, had a lot of power and uh, they exercise it in a very disciplined way, whereas Donald Trump likes to get on the phone and he will call outside people. He seems to have a predilection, aside from hiring very large military officers uh, for his national security positions, uh, the thing we know about Donald Trump is that he, he respects people with a lot of money uh, because he, that's, that's something that he puts inherent value on uh, and he respects uh, uh, people who he perceives to be peers in, in whatever sense. And uh, it does seem that he consults with a lot of people like that. Uh, he's, for example, talking to Rupert Murdoch on the phone all the time by, uh, by all accounts. And I think he has cast the net outside of the White House staff in a way that on the one hand you could say is useful. You know, he's not a captive just sitting in there, uh, a prisoner of the process or of his own schedule in 15 minute increments. On the other hand, uh, this toxic atmosphere surrounding him that, that Peter was describing, I think is something that, that people who've covered the White House for a long time have just never seen anything like it. And what I'm struck by is that people who, who I know who, who've seen multiple different presidencies, uh, they say it is far, far worse than uh, even the extraordinary quotes that we're getting uh, public. And I think that's reflective of Trump's personal management style. Uh, it's not just that these people are careerists and they, they want to call back Peter because they want to find out who's up and who's down. Uh, the reason that that atmosphere persists, I think, is, is very much because of Trump and uh, this is the way it, that he's learned to manage by sort of dividing and making permanently insecure you know, the people surrounding it's him. A, it's a family business, right, right there. I, how about you 
Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I, that's a great question. We did not really talk very much about Russia, and obviously, in many ways, the, the Mueller investigation has just begun. I know we're all eager uh, for the investigation to be over and the evidence presented any day now, uh, but that, I think, is going to take a long time for us really to understand uh, the extent of it. I would say that I personally uh, was floored uh, by the release of those emails, and it, it certainly did, it actually did change my thinking about it. Uh, you know, back in January, it was already clear that Trump had a very uh, bizarre personal affinity with Vladimir Putin, and in general, sort of a predilection to favor authoritarian leaders, and if you look at his foreign policy moves, you see that, right? It's not just Putin, he's made overtures to Egypt's uh, military strongman or to uh, Erdogan and the leadership in Turkey, uh, that in general he's, he's got a bias towards tough guys and strongmen, but that he has something special with Russia was already clear. And yet, I think, for, for me, I was focused in many ways on what are the consequences of this uh, kind of strongman mentality here on American democracy far more than wondering whether Russia specifically changed the outcome of last year's election. But I think the evidence uh, that we've seen publicly since then is, is really extraordinary. We still don't know, obviously, how much Donald Trump himself personally knew. Uh, it's very interesting, obviously, that he was at Trump Tower on the day of this meeting. Uh, you know, I would say for uh, those who are trying to follow this convoluted saga, that when Trump and his son say, oh, well, they just wanted to talk about adoption. Uh, remember that was what Trump said he discussed with Vladimir Putin at their face-to-face -face meeting uh, at the uh, dinner in Germany. It's also what Donald Jr. said was brought up at this meeting. They're not just talking about adoption. Oh, adoption is a code word for the Magnitsky Act and for the sanctions that we've imposed uh, on Russia, and that really, in many ways, is Russia's number one foreign policy priority to reverse with the United States. So I found that to be really significant evidence. Those emails, who knows what was in the exact full email chain, that's incredible that we would have that in writing. Uh, just as I think it is quite remarkable that Donald Trump himself would have already said in an interview with NBC's Lester Holt that he fired the director of the FBI because he didn't want him to further investigate Russia. That's the kind of evidence, uh, you know, that they had to find secret tapes of Nixon in the Oval Office uh, several decades ago uh, and could never have imagined the president himself personally just saying this on TV. I was struck that you mentioned the email specifically. I was struck by one line in the emails more than anything else. The line was, this is part of Russia and its government support of Mr. Trump, all right? Now, did Russia's intervention, whatever it did last year, change the outcome? I'm not at all convinced by that. I haven't seen anything yet that makes me feel like Hillary Clinton didn't lose it all on her own, okay? And that Donald Trump didn't win it all on his own. But, having said that, it's still really, really fascinating that there in writing is a, a straightforward sentence unambiguous, you can't sit there and say I've misinterpreted, which says the Russian government is supporting Mr. Trump's campaign. And I asked him about that during our interview. And I asked him three times, because he, he, he kept drifting away from the question. But I, I said, you know, what about this line? You, you, he said, well, I, was, I didn't know about that meeting. I didn't know about that. I said, okay, yeah, fine, you didn't know a year ago. You know now. Now that you've seen that email, does it trouble you to see that Russia supported you according to this email? Well, he, he said, I, I didn't actually need any support because I was saying so many terrible things about Hillary. I didn't need them to tell me anything terrible about Hillary. I already had more than enough terrible stuff about Hillary. Maybe if she had shot somebody in the back, that would have added to my repertoire. That was his quote. I'm not making that up. Um, so his explanation was he didn't need Russia to give him incriminating information about Hillary Clinton. But that still doesn't answer the fundamental question, which is whether you feel like Russia had any impact on the election or not, does it disturb you as the President of the United States that they there in writing said that they were supporting you and that your son was the recipient of that email. I have to say, my son is 12 years old. Where's Zach back there? I hope, I hope Zach, that if you ever get an email like that, you show it to your parents. <laughs> <laughs>
and the FBI. And the FBI. <laughs> right there, sir. Well, look, this, is, this goes back to the uh, how does this end question. And I think most of you heard the question, which is, will the Republicans ever come around to dumping Trump? And what would that look like? Uh, hearkening back to Watergate times, when, of course, there was the famous delegation uh, that went from Capitol Hill to the White House and uh, you know, told President Nixon that if he did not resign, that there were the votes not only to impeach him, but to convict him in the Senate. You know, Peter's point is well taken, which is that those previous impeachments have occurred when uh, Congress was controlled by a different party than the president, and so we don't have any experience of uh, a party that has such numerical strength in both the House and the Senate uh, actually acting against one of its own. So uh, on the one hand, you would say it's extremely unlikely. On the other hand, Donald Trump seems to be doing everything possible to alienate uh, the congressional leadership of his own party. And you know, you all noticed him going to war last week against Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader. Many people perceive McConnell really to be the center of gravity uh, on Capitol Hill these days and to be the real powerhouse uh, on Capitol Hill as, as Speaker Ryan has you know, a much more fractious and difficult to wrangle caucus in the House really tying his hands. And so you know, if, if Trump were really playing the long game or if he were really acting in a way to make sure that no matter what evidence Mueller produces against him, you know, he would be sort of impeachment proof. You would think he wouldn't be publicly attacking Mitch McConnell, whose wife, by the way, is in his cabinet. <laughs> uh, just like you would think that he would not be attacking his own attorney general, the guy, by the way, who was the very first senator to endorse Donald Trump in the 2016 primary. So he's told people in every way possible that he's not personally loyal to any of these Republicans. And he barely considers himself a member of this party. And so I do believe that were evidence to be presented that was compelling uh, against Trump in some sort of a, an inquiry in the future. He couldn't really count on the long-term personal loyalty of Republicans on the Hill. Yeah. I would say two things real quickly. One is, think of this guy as the first independent to win the presidency. That's really the way to think of him. He won as a Republican, yes, but he ran against both parties in different ways. He is not, he, Republicans do not see him as one of theirs. He does not see himself as one of theirs either. And so he really is, in some ways, the first third party kind of figure to, to occupy the presidency. And that means, therefore, there's not the same loyalty either direction. It's what, by the way, it's one of things that made him popular to some extent because he was somebody who was taking on both parties, both parts of the system. The people who like him, that's a good thing. Drain the swamp. That was the promise. But it does mean that there's no uh, love lost with his own party. And for a president who's at 35% in polls, you're going to see a lot less loyalty on the part of members of your own party. Three data points, real quickly. Six months in, we've now seen three examples in the last two weeks where the Republicans in Washington basically stood up to him. One. They passed almost unanimously legislation against his objections, forcing Russia sanctions on him and stripping his power to lift them. That was almost unanimous in both houses, Republican and Democrat, way past any veto override necessary. Think about that. I can't think of too many times a president has been confronted on a key foreign policy thing by his own party within for six months. Secondly, Sessions. We mentioned Je Attorney General Sessions. What happened with Sessions? The Senate Republicans told him to knock it off. They told him, if you fire Jeff Sessions, we're not confirming another attorney general. 
And in fact, while they're out of session, they're continuing this, this month to have pro forma sessions specifically to block the president of their own party from making a recess appointment. Never happened before. Never happened before. Third data point, last 24 hours. What did the Republicans say when President Trump said, hey, it's both sides in this neo-Nazi thing. You know, there are good neo-Nazis and bad neo-Nazis and good people on the left and bad people on the left. What did the Republicans say? Paul Ryan, George Bush, Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, uh, you know, Thorne Hatch, uh, Ben Sass, not just the Republicans who hate him, but the Republicans who've been relatively supportive, the almost unanimous chorus from the Republican Party saying, we don't subscribe to this. Uh, we think that white supremacists are bad. This is what you should say, Mr. President. They have three times in the last two weeks basically revolted against the president of their party. That for him is a bad sign. So I know we have to go. You've been very patient in the back there. Well, first of all, politicians are not generally, as a group, known for swallowing their egos. <laughs> That's kind of how we got here, and I think it's an excellent point. Trump is clearly playing base politics, and he's clearly decided uh, that the more in a hole he gets and the more that he's been placed on the defensive, in fact, the more he's pivoted back to those who brung him, right? And you see he's increasingly having a strategy of rallies around the country in areas that are perceived to be friendly to him. Uh, you have uh, those strategists who are uh, working with him, talking about, well, the only number that matters is the support that we have from our core supporters, uh, which is a pretty fascinating uh, uh, argument to make if you're, if you're governing a country from a minority that might be as small as a third uh, of the electorate. And so I do think not only is he doing that, but that he's likely to increasingly resort to that kind of small slice of the electorate politics as he gets more and more defensive, uh, right? He's not going to be pivoting to the center. Those folks who are still waiting for Donald Trump uh, to turn towards his general election strategy, uh, that's not gonna be happening anytime soon. Can he win with that strategy in 2020? I think the answer is yes. And you know, obviously, there's an enormous amount of time between now and then, and a, and a lot will depend on 2018. But it does, it does seem that Barack Obama showed that having a political strategy in this day and age of focusing on a core of support and turning that base out uh, is, is a fairly effective way to run modern politics in our very low turnout uh, system that we have of, of elections. Maybe that'll change, but. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that uh, we've seen in the last 16 years is the shrinkage of the center as a political base. Uh, George W. Bush's uh, strategist, Matt Dowd, did a memo for him after 2000 that said that the, the center, the swing votes we used to think were around 25% and we used to always try to appeal to them, they don't exist, that they're really only 6% uh, people who genuinely flip back and forth uh, between parties in the general election. Now, you're asking about the Republican primary, and that's obviously a little different, but um, I think it's a really good question. I think it, this is going to be a chance, this is going to be an opportunity uh, to see what the Republicans want to do. And it will depend on what 2018 looks like. You know, if they have a bad year, that will in, in encourage and invigorate Republican challengers to him, and, and, and they're not likely to sit down in a backfilled room, you know, smoke-filled room, nobody smokes anymore. They're not likely to sit down in a room and say, hey, I pick you because you're gonna be the strongest. It doesn't work that way. So they could split the anti-Trump vote, give him the nomination again. The, I would say the last four incumbent presidents who did not, who wanted another term, did not get one, were challenged within their own party. They were, they were weak inside their own party. So that, again, to the extent that history matters, 
uh, would be a sign if he cannot you know, consolidate his own party. And for the moment, he doesn't seem to have done it. So one last one, Alicia. Please. Something that's driving me crazy is I don't see a strong Democrat anywhere yeah. to, to counter Trump. And I agree with you. I think he's going to get the nomination again in four years. Now, do you, I know you're not into predictions. <laughs> Yeah, the question is basically, she doesn't see any strong Democrat either right now who looks like a promising candidate to take him on. And that's a very good point. Trump has been a good thing for the Democrats in the sense that they have sort of this rallying figure right now to hate, to go after, to, to, to join together, but has, that's only disguised or papered over their own very, very deep internal fundamental problems, which is they don't know what they stand for, right? There's a very big divide inside the Democratic Party today ideologically, and there's no leadership of the next generation coming along to replace the Clinton, Biden, Obama, you know, era leaders. And, um, and there's not, I'm not sure, you know, at the, even at this point far out in 2016, we at least saw Obama as a possibility. We saw Hillary Clinton as a possibility. We saw John Edwards having run and likely to run again. I don't see anybody other than maybe Elizabeth Warren who has any stature within the party, and I don't know that she would be an answer to their problems, but uh, do you see anybody out there on the Democratic side who looks uh, like somebody to pull the party together? You know, look, Joe Biden is uh, ready and waiting for his, <laughs> his call. I mean, you know, that's, I think it's, you've hit you, the nail on the head that uh, it doesn't seem to be going forward to have a whole pack of 70-somethings to take on Donald Trump, uh, the oldest president that we've had since Reagan. And so, you know, I, I Older. is it really going to be uh, the battle of the 70-year-olds once again for two elections in a row. Uh, you know, the Chinese are looking at this and saying, hey, you know, our uh, octogenarian leadership doesn't look so, so old anymore. And so <laughs> uh, I'm skeptical that the Democrats will end up uh, with, with a standard bearer uh, that looks to the past, but it, it's, it's surprising how weak the Democratic bench is after eight years of President Obama. And this brings us full circle, I think, to uh, you know, where, where Peter started this conversation, uh, which is having the unusual experience of having covered eight years of Obama and now covering President Trump, the, the un-Obama. So uh, you know, I guess I would just leave it at that. What do you, uh, what do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think these have been a great set of questions. Uh, I wish we had better answers for you. But thank you very much for taking the time to come out. It's great to see you. Great here to be with friends and family. And uh, yeah, we'll be back.